to everything There is a time A time to weep A time to laugh A time to mourn A time to dance You must know that there's a time For Time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep and cast away. You must know that there's a time for it. of Christ. They give to the cause of having the world come to know who Jesus is. And they give to the cause of feeding people, building schools, orphanages, uh, churches. Uh, the church will benefit because we will grow. Church, but they are 
four grade, well, they call them four years. We call them grades. But they're all meeting in a room which is um, about this size. They can't be accredited because the only way they can get accredited is that each, each child, each grade has to have his own separate building. And so um, this get, affords them the opportunity to have uh, more direct teaching um, and also that they will know that once they finish these four years um, that they'll be accredited and they can go on to, to the next level. Church in Orlando, Florida, under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Vanessa Burns, has completed phase one of a state-of-the-art primary college prep school at Incetata for grades one through 12. Uh, the ministers needed to be trained so that they could serve the people better. So Bishop Carter challenged the missionaries to build a center, and we have done just that, and we are just so proud of the fact that we do have the center. We begin now the worship service that closes the General Connectional Board. It is the service of installation for Bishop Kenneth W. Carter as the chair of the College of Bishops. O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto God with psalms. O oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise God, all ye people. For God's merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. O oh Lord, open thou our lips and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised.
Will you unite with me in the affirmation of faith? You can remain muted, but yet you can say it wherever you are. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Gospel reading for today, Matthew chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. The epistle reading from Romans chapter 8 verses 22 through 28. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now and not only the creation but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Today, Bishop Kenneth Wayne Carter the chairship of the College of Bishops falls to you, the 55th Bishop in order of succession of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. It's my responsibility to transmit a charge to you as you assume the role of chair of the College of Bishops. You served once before in this role as you led us into the new quadrennium in 2010. In his first epistle to the Corinthians, in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul addresses the role of the Holy Spirit in blessing the believers in God's church with gifts. I now read a part of it from the contemporary English version. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but they all come from the same Spirit. There are different ways to serve the same Lord and we can each do different things. Yet the same God works in all of us and helps us in everything we do. I'm amazed at how God has gifted you to see and to hear. We've often quoted the scripture that says, 
your young men shall dream dreams and your old men shall see visions. But long before you were an older man, God was showing you visions. Long before you were an older man, God was sending to your listening ears God's music. You have the unique gift of being able to see the project that exists when all many of us see is the stubby shoot of shrubs and trees. It is more than a song for you to sing. Over my head, there is music in the air. Because you have the ability, and I call it a gift from the Holy Spirit, to hear the symphony in the air when the rest of us wonder whether the wind is blowing strangely. Yours is a unique gift for creativity, for revealing the possibilities that the rest of us do not see the same way and may not see at all. Who else but you could challenge a group of high school students and their parents in the Mississippi Delta that they could succeed as a marching band going from Mississippi to the Rose Bowl Parade in California? Who else but you could convince the College of Bishops to give you the authority to respond to invitations and reach out to the people of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the people in surrounding countries of Eastern and Northern and Southern Africa. Who else but you could cast such a vision that could be caught by some who had questioned our reason for even being where we were in West Africa. In Nigeria during that same quadrennium, you took the dream of the Breeding Montgomery Bible College off the drawing boards and instituted a working organization housed in a building at Ikatek Bene. I witnessed the dedication of a headquarters building at the All Saints Church, a building the people came to that day very proudly. But more than that, I witnessed you challenge them that day to help pay for it. And I heard you say, I know where one third of the money is coming from. If you put two thirds of the money on the table today. Those were your words, except where I'm saying one third and two thirds, you were talking actual money, the Nigerian Naira. And to my astonishment, people who had spoken to me about their poverty for four years responded to you with a joy to express their bounty. And they brought money to the table. Who else but you? I was a witness to you breaking a ground for a parsonage at the Marshall Gilmore Cathedral, the new church in what was called Uyo Township. And I heard a faithful older member at that celebration give you a name, the Restorer, the Restorer, because you had restored people's dreams of their own possibilities and their own gifted abilities. You went into Haiti and in 2011 and 2012, where some of us had only seen stubble and rocks on a hillside, you saw a multi-building complex that would be known as the W. Edward Lockett Village, and it still serves the orphanage for the people today. In Atlanta, you called us together to a unity summit that not only promised to feed, but did feed the hungry and we gave housing to some who were homeless. Only you, upon receiving your appointment back to Eastern Africa in 2018, would see right away the promise of projecting another, a different unity summit of Africans from Burundi and Tanzania, from Rwanda and Egypt, from Kenya and South Africa, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo from Sudan, from Southern Sudan, from Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Uganda, calling all to Kenya and housing them on one large campus. You have been gifted with sight, with vision, with an ability to hear God's directions, the restorer call to hear and restore people to their rightful places before God. An awesome gift. And I very seldom use the word awesome 
For to me, it ought to be in the same sentence with the word God, because God is at work in you. And that is what makes your work awesome. But to whom much is given, much is also required. So I charge you today to remember, to pray for patience, and to persist in directing. Paul Bunyan tells the story of the pilgrim who, when in the thicket of the journey in the valley, had to remind himself of the vision God had given him when he was on the mount. You don't get excited about sharing a lot of meetings. This gavel I'm about to give you doesn't mean a whole lot to you. All of us who work with you know it is true. Your mantra is action, not meeting. But in the thick of the meeting, I charge you to keep before you what God showed you. Sing to yourself if you need to. That old song from our mothers and fathers, sing in your spirit while you preside. You don't know what the Lord told me. You don't know you weren't there. You don't know when and you don't know where. You don't know what the Lord told me. Sing it, remember it, intone it, make it a part of your preparations so that you never lose it even while you lead us. I charge you to pray for patience. As closely as you and I work together, you've heard me say many times, I don't see what you see. And as much as I am disturbed by admitting that vulnerable statement aloud, I'm also saying something that I hope you will hear. Many of us do not see what you see. Be patient with us. Understand that sometimes our ears are dulled because our experiences have been a little more mundane than yours. But also remember that we too have faith. We too have hope. We dream dreams and see visions too. They may not be as habitually fantastical as yours, but the same God who has gifted you has also gifted the rest of us, though in different ways. So pray that you will have patience as you relate to us what God has shown you. Pray that God will open our ears and open our eyes that we may see what you see and hear what you hear and that God may reveal to all of us the symphonic band that God is leading so that we may all together come to these places of new revelation and new sharing and new witnessing of God's blessings. And I charge you last to persist in directing. I wonder what it took out of you in terms of energy and sleepless nights when you led a band of children in the Mississippi Delta and cast before them the vision that they could march the streets of Pasadena, California in the Rose Bowl Parade. You challenged them and they did it, and they will never forget that the highest mountains can be scaled. So as our chair, when you lead us in our devotional moments, give us your best energy. Spend time with God doing what you can do. Listen, hear, see, then focus and direct us. Do it in the name of God. Today do it, tomorrow do it. Do it all of this year because you are uniquely called and gifted for such a time as this, this time of God's restoration. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, you alone are the source and sustainer of your church. We thank you that you have called your servant, Kenneth Wayne Carter, to share in the work of your kingdom as chair of the College of Bishops of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. 
grant him to give himself wholly to the task and service. Grant him sincerity and singleness of mind. Hold ever before him the example of our Lord, who pleased not himself, but gave himself up for us all, that sharing his ministry and consecration, he may enter into his joy. Guide him in his work for your church. Prosper his counsels and his labors. Reward his fidelity with the knowledge that you are using him for the accomplishment of your purposes in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Senior Bishop L.L. L. Reddick and Mrs. Wendy Jones Reddick. To the chair of the College of Bishop, my classmate, Bishop Thomas L. Brown, Sr. and Dr. Louise Baker Brown. To all of the members of the College of Bishops and our spouses. To the general and connectional officers and your spouses. To the members of the Judiciary Council, your spouses. And to the 2020 General Connectional Board members. To the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and to the world. Thank you for this opportunity to serve this church, the church that I love. Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast and unmovable hope and my will and my will, and Kenneth Carter's will get lost somewhere underneath thine. Usually we associate this occasion, the installation of the chair of the College of Bishop as an event. However, today it is my prayer that on this day we won't look at this installation as an event, but as an advent. We usually associate the word advent with Christmas season and the birth of he who would become the risen savior, Jesus the Christ. We have come to understand the word Advent to mean the arrival of something new. The very fact that I am accepting this office through the motive, th through the remote communication and we have gathered in our virtual places of worship is a direct manifestation of our something new. Except in the mantle again, in the midst of the world's new way of doing everything, give me the permission to speak to a pandemic advent from the book of Romans. During the season of advent, we sing songs of the church with vigor and vitality. We sing with loud and with enthusiasm. Some of us sing as an act of praise and others as an act of worship. And others sing them to cover up the melody of pain. During the season of Advent, thousands and maybe millions of children will experience this season without mother and or father. Family experiencing loneliness of a special loved one not by their side. Many will journey through the moments facing discord melodies, unemployment, hunger, lack of health care, depression, hopelessness, fear, pain and distress, the loss of sons and daughter as a result of COVID-19, gun violence and police brutality. Yet in Advent, we still sing songs of joy and peace. But those happy and exciting sounds are now replaced by the harsh shouts of racism from police and soldiers. The cry of, I can't breathe. The wailing of grieving mothers and fathers and black lives that seem not to matter. The scripture lesson. The scripture lesson that was previously read, previously read from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 18, and Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 28, leads us to my subtopic. Do you, Do you hear? hear? The Christian Methodist Episcopal Church hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? I hear the voices of parents crying in the night. I hear the sirens of police cars speeding across the streets. I hear the sounds of ambulance. I hear the sounds of the crowd across the world gathering in streets protesting 
injustice and demand equality for all human beings. I hear the wailing and the screaming of the relatives of the victims. I hear the cry of babies missing their mothers and fathers. Do you hear what I hear? Too many voices have been silenced. Too many have drawn their last breath, often after violent array of bullets and the knee in the neck, neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Their lives should have mattered somewhere along the line. Too many of our young African-American men and women have been gunned down by the hands of insensitive and in some cases, untrained police over the past few years. When Michael Brown was shot to death by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, in August 2014, it sparked a movement that began with the previous killing of another black teenager, Trayvon Martin who was shot in 2012 by a neighborhood watch volunteer, George Zimmerman. Both voices were silent, but I can still hear them. Can you? On August 5th, 2014, John Crawford III in Dayton, Ohio, was fatally shot while holding a pellet gun in Walmart. The gun was, in, was on sale in Walmart. And the man by the name of Ronald Ritchie told 911 that Crawford looked like he was pointing at people. However, a month later, he admitted that Crawford was not pointing the gun at people. Do you hear? what I hear. Dante Hamilton, 31, was fatally shot 14 times by a police officer in Milwaukee Park. Do you hear what I hear? Eric Garner, 43, was killed after he was put in an illegal chokehold for 15 seconds by a white officer allegedly for selling loose cigarettes. Garner said, I can't breathe, 11 times, as he held down, was held down by several officers. Do you hear what I hear? Ezel Ford, a 25-year-old mental ill man, was shot three times, including one in his back by a white police officer. And Ford was unarmed. Dante Parker, a 36-year-old father of five, died in police custody after being repeatedly stunned by a taser in San Bernardino County, California. Tanisha Anderson, 37, died after officers in Cleveland allegedly slammed her head into the pavement while taking her into custody. Anderson's family said that she was bipolar and had bipolar disorders and schizophrenia. Jerome Reed, 36, was shot and killed by police officers in Bridgeton, New Jersey. He was a passenger in a car driven by his friend who was pulled over by the police and in the dash cam video footage of the stop, the officers heard claiming and telling him to stay in the car. Yet, he got out of the car with his hands across his chest. That's when the officer's day and worldly opened fire, striking him and killing Reed. On July 13, 
2015, Sandra Bland, a 28-year-old African-American woman, was found dead in her jail cell in Walker County, Waller County, Texas. Three days after being arrested over a traffic stop gone wrong. Freddie Gray, 25, died of a spinal cord injury a week after he was arrested by Baltimore police. May 25, 2020, changed the path forward of the Black Lives Matter movement. George Floyd, 46, was arrested after a convenience store employee called 911 and told the police that Mr. Floyd brought cigarettes with a counterfeit $20 bill. The world saw a white police officer by the name of Derek Chauvin place his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, not for one or two or three or four minutes, but for eight minutes and 46 seconds, we heard Mr. Floyd express how difficult it was to simply just breathe. Please, please, I can't breathe. Please, man, please, the man. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Breathe, man. I can't breathe. I've been trying to hear about this. So you can breathe, Do you hear what I hear? The young and old of all ethnic backgrounds, not just in America, but across the world are rising up to say black lives matter. The agitated are rising up. The oppressed are rising up. Surely the hymnness was correct. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Do you hear what I hear? Have you ever experienced hurt so bad that it's caused you to groan? I'm not talking about a paper cut or a headache, a stump in your toe or a gash in your head, but real hurt. Hurt to the point that you don't know, have adequate words to say. Hurt so deep that there's no number on the doctor's chart to relate to your hurt. Paul writes about this kind of groaning hurt as he expressed his concern to the church at Rome. As we sit here in this remote General Connectional Board meeting in our virtual conference room, we are challenged to live in a very difficult and confusing world, a world filled with sick people, sick ideas, tattered by the wicked darts of evil, a world with more injustice than justice, more insecurity than security. Paul writes and tells us of this kind of world is sickness, sadness, and pain. But is there any hope in sight? Is there any relief nearby? Can you hear the groans? Hidden between Romans 8 and 1 that lets us know that in Christ there is no condemnation. And in Romans 8, 28 that reassures us that God will work it out. Paul inserts 
Paul sneaks in a groan. Paul compares this groaning to that of a woman in childbirth. This means that the world view and the current situation had gotten so far out of hand and out of control that the season of groaning for him and the church was appropriate. Can you hear the groan of Michael and Eric and Tamir, Kendrick, Trayvon, and George? Can you hear the groan of the mothers and the fathers who sacrificed to provide for their sons and daughters only to have their lives tragically taken from them? Can you hear the groan of black men drinking themselves to an early grave because they are all aware of their second class citizenship rankings in this society? Can't you hear the groan? It's a time when a young white man entered into the most sacred space and place and pretend to worship but kill nine African Americans in Bible study instead? Can you hear the groan of the political leaders demanding that our children return to a school building during the pandemic with no regards of their safety or well-being? Can you hear the groan of young mothers selling their sons and daughters for another hit. Listen to the groan. Listen to the groan. Do you see a me? Hear what I hear. And as we journey through the groan, Paul reminds us that they are like the groans of childbirth, travailing in giving birth, yet we ignore the groan. The world in which we live groans for reconciliation. We need wholeness. We need to return to the God that can put us back together again. This world. Yet in the midst of this groan is a special creation of God. Dr. Trevor Hudson of South Africa said, the world was God's first fiance. Yet it is filled with dissonant chords of groaning. But not only does the world groan. Check out verse 23 in our text. We, we groan. We the creatures and creations of God groan. We the baptized born again believers groan. We the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Martin, and Malcolm groan. We the sons and daughters of Mile and Vanderhorst and Jose and Lane and BB groan. We all groan. We all hurt. We all have this excruciating pain. We groan. We groan. Grown. The church also groan. Even the CME church groans. Every time we sing certain hymns, we find ourselves singing the groans of a church. The state of the black church groans. The church universal groan. Can you prove it? You know I can. Songwriters portray the groans of the church. Come here, John Newton. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me on. Testify, Horatio Spafford, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea bill a roll, whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Help me prove it 
Elijah Hoffman, I must tell Jesus, all of my trials, I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. Co-partner in Methodist, Charles Wesley states, and are we yet alive to see each other's face? What problems have we seen? What mighty conflict passed? Fighting within and fears without since we assemble last. Yes, 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 even the church groans. But do you hear what I hear? We have our hurts, our pain, our disappointment, but we cannot give up. We must trust in the same God that has brought us safely this far. Every one of us is groaning today in this video conference. We might be in the midst of a silent groan, but yet we groan. I'm reminded of the words of my, my mentor, one of my mentors, Dr. Raymond F. Williams. It was because of him that I was able to finish Howard with the help of his church and with his fatherly guidance. And once I graduated, I went to Dr. Williams and I asked him, how can I, how can I repay you for all you've done for me? He said, Kenneth, the people that you're going to serve are hurting people. And I want you to know that every person sits right next to the pool of their own tears. Not only is the world groaning, not only are we groaning, the black church and community must take time to listen to the groaning of others. Bishop Desmond Tutu tells the story of a little girl that he met. He asked the little girl, have you ever been hungry? And she replied, yes, sir. He asked, where do you get food? And she replied, when we don't have any, we borrow it. And he said, what happens when you can't borrow it? And she said, I just drink water, water, water. This moved Bishop Tutu not only to hear the groan of that little girl, but the millions of children across the world. We need more Desmond Tutus in our world to listen to the groan of others. When we had, when was the last time that you've heard the groan of someone else? When was the last time you did something other than just hearing the groan? We must march. We must march. We must march and run to the polls in November and carry folk with us to vote, 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 and vote. We must act, and we must act now. What are we going to do? Can't you hear the groan of the mothers and fathers of Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Kenya Johnson, Tavon Martin? What about the crying children of Eric Garner. We must act. Not burning down businesses. Not luring stores. Nor burning down churches. But we must act by keeping our money in our pockets. Express to our legislators that we will organize the vote. And we will vote and then we'll vote you in or we'll vote you out. But we must act quickly. But before I get to the reconciliation, there's one final groan. The groan of God. The Holy Spirit, God, helps us 
in our distress. For we don't even know what should we pray for. No, how should we pray? But the Holy Spirit, God, prays for us with the groaning that cannot be expressed by words. This is the deepest groan of them all. If we're to reconcile these United States and the world, we must become a portrait of God. We must look like God. We must stay God-centered. Don't do evil for evil. God is at work. He sees all. He knows all. And payday is coming. And it's coming soon. We must be willing to give up something on God's behalf. We must become like God in our worship, sensing the groan of others. You remember Gethsemane? His praying groan? Father, let not this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, if I must die, it's not about self. It's about the kingdom of God. Michael and Eric and Kendrick and Trevon and Joy and others, death didn't catch God off guard. He knows, yes, he knows. Just how much we can bear. Don't give up. Keep working for the kingdom. So how do we deal with the call and response to the groaning? It comes only through intercessory prayer. We can't hear if our prayer ears are not on. We cannot hear unless we are one in the spirit and one in the Lord. Because when we have an intercessory groaning, God's spirit is in our spirit. And the two spirits will connect together. And don't be afraid. Yes, sometimes you will act different. Sometimes your, your vocal language, your prayer language will change. But don't be afraid. That's real worship. For as there are two spirits, there are also two groanings. And I had to learn this. I learned this the summer of 2006 when I was attending the World Methodist Conference in Seoul, South Korea. I suffered a blood clot in my right leg. And roles were distinguished between my groaning of real pain and my groaning of being babyish. When I was really hurting, Rose would roll over and would rub my leg and release the pain. All oh, but when I wanted to act like a baby, she just turned over and continued her process of sleeping. Yes, when we get real with God, God bears our cry and hears our every groan. And once we stop playing games with God, for us to cry to get his attention, rather than cry out for his full and real relief, then we will not hear from God. But only then, once we hear the groan, and then act on that groan, then and only then, we can see, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied my every groan. Long as I live and trouble rise, I'll haste unto his throne.
join me in a prayer for the church. Let us bow and let us pray. O oh God, source of all goodness, we pray for your church, which is set today amidst the perplexities of a changing order and face to face with new tasks. Baptize us afresh in the life-giving spirit of Jesus. Bestow upon us a great responsiveness to duty, a swifter compassion with suffering, and an utter loyalty to the will of God. Help us to proclaim boldly the coming of the kingdom of God and put upon our lips the good news of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Fill us with the prophet's scorn of tyranny and give us a Christ-like tenderness for the heavy laden and the downtrodden. Grant us that we would cease from seeking our own life, lest we lose it. Make us valiant as your church to give up ourselves for humanity so that like our crucified Lord, we may mount by the path of the cross to a higher glory. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Together we say, Amen. <laughs>
And now for the benediction this day, God has blessed us to hear reports, to deal with the day-to-day -day business of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. God has blessed us to hear good music, even in an era when we are not singing aloud together. God has blessed us with the intonation of a powerful word ringing in our ears, in our hearts, and in our wills. Let us go forward then in the name of that God, even to our distant places. This scripture made the most sense to me when in a kitchen at a table, I addressed a dilemma in a far country when I was Bishop of the 10th Episcopal District. And I knew my call could not solve the dilemma. And I knew I only had my prayers to depend upon. But I also knew that God was able. So let us receive the benediction, the grace, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit. May it rest, rule, and abide with you now and forevermore. It is my prayer as we adjourn this general connectional board. Amen.